Welcome to our annual lecture, lecture series, Remembering Lee. We're so glad to have each of you here on the 147th anniversary of Lee's death to remember the contributions of the 11th president of Washington College. My name is Lucy Wilkins, and I'm the director of University Collections and Lee Chapel and Museum. One of the privileges of this position is to be able to tell the story of the remarkable contributions of both George Washington and Robert E. Lee and what they did to uh, actually change higher education through the work here at this university. If you're unfamiliar with this story, I encourage you to take time for one of our tours and to digest the content of our museum, which was so beautifully curated by Patricia Hobbs. I'd like to recognize this morning the representatives of the United Daughters of the Confederacy who are in attendance today. The UDC has a long history of support for the chapel, and we are happy to have such a good representation from the Virginia Division and local Lexington uh, as well. Our speaker today is Dr. Kenneth No, the Drawn Professor of Southern History at Auburn University in Alabama. He is actually a native of the Valley uh, as he grew up in Elliston, Virginia, which if you don't know is in Montgomery County, and he attended Shawsville High School. So welcome home, Dr. No. Dr. No received his PhD from the University of Illinois and taught at West Georgia College for 10 years before taking his current position at Auburn in 2000. Dr. No teaches classes on the American Civil War and Appalachian history. He is the author or editor of seven books. Two of those books uh, are on sale in our museum shop today, but I'm sorry to say one of them is already sold out. Uh, but we do have, I'll give my uh, little um, ad uh, for these books today. We still have plenty of copies of this one, which is uh, Reluctant Rebels, the Confederates Who Joined the Army in 1861. <clears throat> okay. He's written many mar uh, articles and essays, including articles in Civil War History and the Journal of Military History. He was a Pulitzer Prize entrant and the winner of the 2003 Kentucky Governor's Award. He holds the 2002 Peter Seaborg Book Award for, the Civil, for Civil War Nonfiction, the 1997 Tennessee History Book Award, and several teaching awards. He currently serves on the advisory board of the Society of Civil War Historians and was a consultant to the NBC series, Who Do You Think You Are? Today, we will get a sneak peek at Dr. No's research for his upcoming book on Civil War weather. Most of us are familiar with the effect of weather on Jackson's Valley campaign and even on the plans for President Lee's funeral but perhaps we're not so familiar with the challenges weather presented for Lee in Western Virginia. The title of Dr. No's lecture today is A Storm to Destroy My Hopes, Weather and Robert E. Lee's Great Cheat Mountain Campaign. So thank you, Dr. No, for joining us today and for sharing with us the benefit of your scholarship. There will be a short time for questions after Dr. No speaks to us. Uh, we ask that you wait until we hand you a microphone uh, before you ask your question so it can be heard by those who are listening by live stream. So please welcome Dr. No. Thank you. You all hear me okay? Good. Okay. So when I was in fourth grade, we studied the Civil War. And at the end of the year, they loaded us all up on school buses, and they brought us up here. At some point downstairs, I bought not my first book on the Civil War, but my first real book on the Civil War, which is to say it didn't look like a comic book. Uh, so it's pretty interesting for me to be up here speaking today, um, given that that was almost exactly 50 years ago. Uh, and for that, there are several people I want to thank. I want to thank Lucy Wilkins for inviting me, um, Cassie Ivey, I don't know if Cassie's here right now, she said she'd be in and out, there's Cassie, uh, who did a lot to coordinate my trip up here, uh, Barton and Molly Myers uh, for, I think, for suggesting me, but also for being great hosts, 
And I want to thank all of you all for coming. Uh, I very much appreciate that. Um, I'm going to shout out my friend Henry Bryan, who's sitting in the back, who uh, used to sit with me on the school bus when I was a kid and uh, drove up from Elliston today. So that's really, really nice, and I appreciate it very much. Um, Storm to destroy my hopes, weather and Lee's cheat mountain campaign. Um, I spoke to at least three folks downstairs during the book signing who actually knew where Cheat Mountain is, and that's very exciting for me. But if you don't know about the Cheat Mountain campaign, uh, don't feel bad. It's the forgotten campaign, I think, of Lee's Civil War career. Uh, it was his first one as a commander. Cheat Mountain is in West Virginia. It's right along the Randolph-Pocahontas County line. Uh, if I was in my classroom and I had my big old PowerPoint behind me and we'd have a map of Virginia and West Virginia and I would show you where Cheat Mountain is, but at the very least try to imagine, if you will, a map like that. If you take a straight edge or a ruler and set it basically on Harrisonburg, draw a line west through the valley over the Alleghenies and it will take you almost exactly to Cheat Mountain. In the fall of 1861, Cheat Mountain was a very important part of the Confederacy. And it was an area that the Confederacy could ill afford to lose, as it did. As I talk about the Cheat Mountain campaign today, um, there are going to be four themes that come up pretty regularly. So let me tell you about those. First of all, most obviously, R.E. Lee himself. Uh, since this is part of the Remembering Lee continuing series. His first campaign as commanding officer, as I said, I think his most neglected one, if not ignored on purpose sometimes. Second theme is one that most people don't like to talk about. It's an unpleasant theme sometimes, but I think we need to go there today. And that's the theme of failure. Lee himself considered the Cheat Mountain Campaign a failure. Uh, so did many people in the Confederacy, uh, notably the Richmond media, members of Congress, members of the Army, uh, common Confederates around uh, the Confederate nation. And in some ways, it nearly destroyed Lee's career before it really got started. But I think if we analyze what happened at Cheat Mountain, if we try to understand why Lee thought his plans failed, it helps fill in some gaps. It gives us some context to understand how Lee will act as a general later in the war, once he takes command of what's going to become the Army of Northern Virginia in the summer of 1862. And don't forget, when he took command of that army after Joe Johnston was wounded at Seven Pines, he was not a popular choice. The newspapers essentially attacked Jefferson Davis for choosing someone who was best known for losing West Virginia, a general who had not done well previously. And so did many of the soldiers in that army. If we understand Cheat Mountain, we'll understand why they were concerned. And we'll also understand the reaction when Lee performed very differently during the seven days. Third theme that I'll touch on from time to time is the simple fact that this campaign took place in the mountains, uh, the area that we now tend to call Appalachia. That tends to be a forgotten part of the Civil War. If you think about my fourth grade experience, remember we had been studying the war all year, but in order to actually see some Civil War sites, they brought us up to Lexington. Clearly the assumption was that there was nothing to see in Montgomery County or anywhere nearby. And it was really only later in my life that I learned that federal troops had been in Blacksburg and Christiansburg in 1864, that the Confederates in that part of the county had essentially retreated down the Valley Road right past my house uh, to a place called Big Hill in Roanoke County. Uh, there were Civil War markers here and there where my grandfather used to go to see friends. We got hay up one summer in Pulaski County across from the Cloyd's Mountain Battlefield, but yet I think we all grew up with a sense that the Civil War was something that happened somewhere else. And if we think of the war as just a series of big battles fought by the major armies 
uh, it's easy to see why that sort of, I think, wrong image would develop. But remember, the Civil War happened everywhere. Um, families who had loved ones off in the war, enslaved people who were dreaming of freedom and ultimately obtaining it, guerrilla warfare, irregular warfare, was ripe in the Appalachian Mountains. And for most people in that part of the world, the war would be characterized not by campaigns like Cheap Mountain, but by the everyday fear of insurgents showing up and causing some sort of trouble or worse. Um, my friend Bart Myers, who's sitting up here near the front, has just published a wonderful chapter in Wesley Moody's new book, Seven Myths of the Civil War. I recommend it, and it reminds us that the war was much more all-encompassing than I think we sometimes remember. And finally, I want to talk about weather. Because, as Lucy said, for the last six years now, almost seven, I think, I have been researching and now writing a book on weather in the American Civil War. And you might wonder why. I mean, if we know about your particular favorite battle, you probably know something about the weather there. You probably know something about uh, the flooding at Fort Henry or the sleet at Fort Donelson or the tremendous rain and red mud down on the peninsula. You might know about the drought that occurred in the summer of 1862 that shaped the Perryville campaign in Kentucky. We all know a little bit about Civil War weather, but we tend to compartmentalize what we know. I think what I've been trying to do, ultimately, is connect all those dots to try to get a better sense of what weather in the Civil War looked like, how it affected the war, how it affected the armies, how it affected the home front. And I confess that the more I've learned, the more interested I have been. Now, from time to time, I go places and I talk more generally about Civil War weather, and I'm not going to do a lot of that today since I'm here to talk about a very specific subject. But just to give you some more context, let me tell you a little bit about Civil War weather, because I think you might find it useful, not just for the rest of my talk, but perhaps as you examine the war most, more closely from here on out. The big fact, perhaps, to take home today about Civil War weather is that it was unusual. It was not typical. It was not ordinary. In fact, Civil War weather tended to be rather extraordinary. When we left my house in Alabama yesterday, my poor wife had to drive up an hour and a half from Auburn up to the Atlanta airport uh, through what was left of, I guess at that point, tropical storm Nate. We've had quite a season of hurricanes down where I live. In 1862, 1863, and 1864, no hurricanes struck the American coast. That's the longest period in recorded weather history in which there were no hurricanes. Geographers like to talk about something they call the Great Civil War Drought that actually began in the late 1850s and spread across the American West. A drought so pervasive that it changed political relations out there. At one point, the Comanche Empire was strong enough to stand up to both the United States Army and the Mexican Army until the drought came and the grass died and their horses died and they couldn't fight back anymore. The fall of 1861 was exceptionally rainy. December 1861 was one of the warmest months anyone in Virginia could remember, with temperatures regularly in the 70s. And people were writing letters. We don't know what's going on. We have flowers blooming. We don't know what to think about this. At the beginning of 1862, Stonewall Jackson's soldiers found out all too painfully on their way to Bath and Romney, incredible precipitation, first snow in higher elevations and then rain essentially through the first six months of the war. And then in summer, 
especially across the Appalachians, but certainly here in Virginia too, a tremendous drought. And it happened again in 1863. And it happened again in 1864. Anybody who's ever worked on a farm or even gardened will immediately understand what that kind of spring rain and summer drought will do to your fields, to your garden. Now imagine that happening across the Confederacy. Planting occurred late. Some crops rotted in the field because the fields were too wet. And what managed to survive that grew a little bit until the summer drought came. And then the Confederate food supply began to die in the fields. Those same unusual weather conditions largely produced bumper crops in the American Midwest and in the Northeast. People living in the upper Midwest had to deal with really early frosts that cost a lot of their crops. Um, by early, I mean August 30th, 1863, in one case. But nonetheless, northern agriculture had produced so much that the Union never had to worry about having enough to eat. The Confederacy constantly had to worry about that. Throw in communication lines being cut, loss of railroads, throw in the fact that some of the bread baskets of the Confederacy, like Middle Tennessee, were lost early. And there's a real concern of famine. The Confederate government will have to make really tough decisions about who do we feed with what we have? Do we feed the army? Or do we worry first about the civilian population? The Davis administration made the decision to feed the army by taking what it could from the civilian population, which created all sorts of opposition and loss of support for the Confederacy. And wives writing home to their husbands about how they were going hungry. We know about the dissension. We know about the opposition. You can go down to the library here, to the library over at VMI, and you can find many books, shelves of books, on this so-called internalist explanation of Confederate, Confederate defeat, the notion that the Confederacy fell apart from within rather than from pressure from without. And almost none of those books will tell you about this drought because historians, by and large, don't know anything about it. It's just not common knowledge in my field. Now, you might ask why. And the truth is, meteorologists, especially those who are interested in historical meteorology, don't really know. I think every time I ask somebody, they give me a different answer. When I first started out working on this, uh, most people assumed that it was the El Nino phenomenon, which our weathermen and weather women like to talk about pretty regularly on the evening news. Uh, there was a period when others pointed to the opposite, the La Nina effect. Uh, the last time I looked, I think we were back to thinking about El Nino accompanied by a similar sort of surface temper, temperature, excuse me, surface temperature oscillation out in the Atlantic. There's no agreement. What we know is that Civil War weather was incredibly unusual and that by negatively affecting the Confederate food supply and by positively affecting the Union food supply, in many ways the weather conditions played into the hands of the Union and helped the Lincoln administration win the war. Certainly not the only reason. I'm not a monocausalist. I don't believe in one explanation for anything, but certainly it's a factor we haven't thought much about. So what about West Virginia? What about Cheat Mountain? I've probably already given away my punchline in that a lot of what happened in that campaign is going to be shaped by the weather in that part of West Virginia. Today, the U.S. Department of, Ag of Energy, excuse me, Department of Energy, divides the United States up into eight so-called climate zones. And a climate zone basically is determined by how many days a year you have to turn on the heater to heat your house up to a certain degree. Most of the Confederacy was in either of two of these climate zones. Uh, you live, Lexington is, 
in one called the Mixed Humid Zone. And it was pretty darn humid yesterday, as I remember. Uh, I live in Alabama. I've spent the last 28 years living in Georgia and Alabama. I live in what is called the Hot Humid Zone. It's well named. I mean, to the point that we're starting to think about, you know, where can we retire and get out of this humidity? But Northern West Virginia is an exception. Northern West Virginia, and that was still Virginia in 1861, of course, is part of the cl climate zone that runs across the Midwest and into the Northeast, into Pennsylvania and New York. It's called the cold climactic zone. Winters in that zone tend to be five to 10 degrees cooler than winters in our mixed humid zone. It was colder in the mountains. The mountains tended to shield uh, the Cheat Mountain area from any temperature oscillations uh, caused by the Atlantic. Summers were very, very rainy. Around Cheat Mountain, they averaged about 50 inches of precipitation per year, per year with storms and flash floods. So imagine an area that is already in a normal year rainy in the summer and cold in the winter. What essentially happens in 1861, something that no one is really expecting, is that the summer of 1861 was much rainier than usual. And when it turned cold, it turned cold earlier than expected and was colder than usual. And I'm going to argue in a few minutes that that has a definite effect on the Cheat Mountain campaign, and of course I'm going to argue at the end that the Cheat Mountain campaign has a definite effect on the career of R.E. Lee. So where do we start? May 26th, 1861. Union troops under the command of George McClellan, who stayed behind in Ohio for a while, cross the Ohio River into the state of Virginia. Their immediate target was the town of Grafton, Grafton was on the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. The B&O was the major connector between the Northeast and the Midwest. The Lincoln administration had to have the B&O. The Confederates wanted to cut it. Confederate troops at Grafton realized immediately that they were outnumbered, and they retreated without much of a fight. This by itself was a blow to the hopes of the Confederacy as it allowed the B&O to stay intact. And from time to time, generals like Stonewall Jackson would attempt to cut the B&O, but generally not for very long. The Confederates who had been at Graft and retreated to the south, to the town of Philippi. Some people call it Philippi, but my aunt grew up near there, and she always said Philippi, so we're going with Aunt Emma today. It's Philippi. And on June 3, 1861, Union and Confederate forces at Philippi fought the first land battle of the American Civil War. The first land battle of the American Civil War was not at Manassas. It was at Philippi. And it was a battle that was very much shaped by weather conditions. The Confederates at Philippi were commanded by Colonel George Porterfield. The Federals marching to Philippi were commanded by a general from Indiana named Thomas Morris. The night before the battle, Morris developed a battle plan. He was going to divide his superior force in half, more or less. He was going to attack Philippi at dawn with half of his army. But during the night, the other half was supposed to go around a mountain, go behind Philippi, cut off the back door, and in theory, that entire Confederate force would be captured. That night, thunderstorms occurred, and they boomed all night with heavy rain. Roads turned to mud. It was a dark night. Down in Philippi, Colonel Porterfield felt so sorry for his pickets and his guards that he set orders out, essentially telling them, don't worry, come on in, sleep in your tents, get out of the rain. Surely the Yankees aren't crazy enough to attack on a night like this. And so there were no guards out at all the next morning at dawn when Morris's Federals attacked the Confederates at Philippi. They were caught completely by surprise. They retreated in a hurry. They ended up retreating about 40 miles. 
Uh, the Richmond Papers referred to this ever after as the Philippi races. But if you think about it, how was it they were able to run away 40 miles? How was it they were able to fall back? That was because that other part of the federal attack had gotten lost in the dark and bogged down in the mud, and they weren't where they were supposed to be. And so the Confederates got away from Philippi. Nonetheless, the first great defensive line of the Confederacy in Western Virginia had been broken. In Richmond, R. E. Lee suggested that it might be for the best of the service if George Porterfield was fired. The Confederate Army of the Northwest, as it was called, began to consolidate to try to establish a second defensive line and stop this federal onslaught because there were more federal troops coming across the river every day. They were under the command of General Robert Garnett. Garnett constructed his defensive line focusing on two positions called Laurel Hill and Rich Mountain. Both of those places were important. One was on the main road south, deeper into western Virginia, and the other was on the road that crossed the Alleghenies and led to Stanton. So theoretically, if you lose those roads, not only could the Federal Army penetrate deeper into West Virginia, but they could cross over into the Shenandoah. The Federals approached, but slowly, because it kept raining. Mud slowed down boots and wheel vehicles, caissons, guns, wagons. And it took a while for the Federals to consolidate and move up. On July 11, 1861, they finally struck. McClellan had just arrived. He left the battle up to his second in command, General William Rosecrans. Rosecrans attacked the Confederates at Rich Mountain, drove them off the mountain, which must have been an amazing feat. Uh, years ago, I drove up to Rich Mountain. I took the road up to the top of Rich Mountain, and then I drove back down. It had been raining, and even in my car, I was terrified given how steep Rich Mountain was, especially in rainy weather. The second Confederate defensive line in West Virginia had been broken. Garnett knew that he had to retreat now and try to establish a third. He pulled back from Laurel Hill. The Federal Army pursued, and two days after Rich Mountain on July 13th, Robert Garnett was killed near Cheat Mountain. And there, his army essentially stopped. This was disastrous for Confederate hopes in the West. There was now a very real possibility that Virginia and the Confederacy might lose northwestern Virginia. And things were getting worse, not better, because now another Union army was coming up the Kanawha River from the Ohio. Several thousand troops commanded by General Jacob Cox pushed into Charleston, took Charleston, kept moving past Charleston, down toward the Gauley River, uh, toward Sewell Mountain. And the only Confederates around Sewell Mountain who were there to stop them were parts of two entirely small and separate forces commanded by two former Virginia governors who despised each other. Henry Wise from the Eastern Shore and John B. Floyd from my Montgomery County and they absolutely refused to cooperate with each other, as they had essentially done through their entire political career. At one point, Floyd crossed the Gauley River in an attempt to block Cox. He asked Wise to come join him. Wise said, I've read books about war. I'm not gonna fight with a river at my back. These two Confederate groups remained separated. This also was a recipe for disaster. So what do you do? Your two defensive lines have been broken. Federals are moving deeper into West Virginia. There's another column now. We've lost Charleston. What on earth could the Davis administration do? President Davis made two choices. He decided to send about 5,000 reinforcements into West Virginia, and he sent R.E. Lee. A lot of what transpired between Davis and Lee, we don't know about. A lot of it was verbal. We're not exactly sure what Davis's orders were to this day. Was he told to go out there and take command or just coordinate the other generals? But nonetheless, Lee left Richmond. He headed to Stanton. 
and he went to find the Confederate Army of the Northwest. He reached Huntersville, and he found them there. With the death of Robert Garnett, the Army of the Northwest was commanded by William Wing Loring, largely known as a Floridian, certainly not native to the region. And conditions in Huntersville were tough. It started raining the last week in July. And to look ahead to my conclusion in a few minutes, it kept raining well into September. Relatively few days were dry, so you have to imagine constant rain, heavy rain, mud, mire, men slipping, wagons slipping, uh, roads becoming useless. This was the situation that R.E. Lee rode into when he arrived at Huntersville. He also discovered that Loring had already managed to alienate most of the men under his command. At one point, Loring was riding along a column of marching soldiers. And somebody said something like, this looks like a fine body of men. And Loring replied, well, they look fine, but they're not soldiers. You know what makes soldiers, he said being able to live outside in bad weather for months on end. We'll find out in the spring if these men are good soldiers or not. Well, if you heard that, it was hard to be optimistic about what you were going to be going through the next few weeks. Richard Waldrop of the 21st Virginia was one of those reinforcements sent in along with Lee. And he wrote home, mountains are very pretty things when you wind along them on a railroad or even when riding slowly over them on horseback. But to have to walk over three of them in one day through mud and water detracts very much from their beauty. Lee arrived in Huntersville late in July and spent the next several days trying to convince William Loring to march his men up closer to Cheat Mountain. At that point, they were about 40 miles away, and Loring absolutely refused to do it. So after several days of cajoling and trying to convince Loring to do what seemed obvious, on August 6th, Lee had enough. He took most of Loring's army, six brigades, about 5,000 men, and he started marching them up himself. Uh, it was a place called Valley Mountain. It was about halfway between Cheap Mountain and Huntersville, and that's where Lee took the army. He saw it as a staging area for what would be, hopefully, an attack on Cheat Mountain, an attack that would stop the federal onslaught and hopefully retake some of that lost territory. It rained on them all the way. The ro roads became terrible with mud. Unlike Loring, Lee at least managed to win the affections of the men under his command, a story that was often told that August and repeated many times after the war it was about a young soldier who had been trying to get out of the rain so he had sat down on a log he had wrapped his weapon up in a blanket he may have fallen asleep it depends on who's telling the story and he was found sleeping on guard duty and his regimental officers determined that he needed to be shot as a lesson to the other men but they really didn't want to shoot him so they went to see Lee about it. And Lee said, don't shoot him. After all, he suggested, it just have, as easily could have been any of us trying to get out of the rain. Now, when soldiers told the story after the war, they thought it was an example of Lee's Christian kindness, and it may very well have been. But unlike those soldiers, we have access to Lee's letters from the time. And I think there was more going on than just kindness. Because quite frankly, the weather was starting to get to Lee as well. He was pessimistic about his assignment. He was pessimistic about what the Confederates could accomplish. He called it a forlorn hope expedition. 
These men were hungry, they were poorly equipped, they were often sick, and then there was the weather, which never seemed to let up. He wrote to his wife on August 9th, there surely is no lack of moisture at this time. It has rained, I believe, some portion of every day since I left Stanton. Now it's pouring and the wind, having veered around to every point on the compass, has settled down to the northeast. This rain and these northeastern winds continued until August 14th, and the rain stopped for four days. But dry weather brought no relief because as a cold front moved into the Cheap Mountain area, freezing weather came with it. Ice formed all around the Confederate camp at Valley Mountain. And up on Cheap Mountain, where the Federals were building a uh, log enclosure they would call Fort Milroy, it snowed on August 14th. Let's talk about the weather being unusual in the Civil War. Colonel Robert Hatton commanded a Tennessee regiment at Valley Mountain. He wrote his wife, we have winter on us this morning. He capitalized winter. We have winter on us this morning. The rain has ceased, at least temporarily, and the wind is blowing as cold as usual in Tennessee in November. Have not known a more sudden change in temperature. Yesterday it was raining and warm. In the evening, growing cold, continuing to rain. By midnight, it was so cold that I got up and piled on top of my cot all my coats and pants to keep from getting cold. The wind blows like winter. Ice was abundant yesterday morning, a large frost covering the ground. To keep it all comfortable, we have to build large log fires and keep close to them morning and night. Ice and snow in the middle of August. August 18th, it warmed up again. And of course it started raining again. And this time there was flooding. Ham Chamberlain, you may have heard of Ham Chamberlain, still serving with 21st Virginia at this time, called it some of the hardest rain I ever saw, till sundown, till camp, wading six or seven creeks, much more than knee deep. The ordinarily dry beds of streams had become large creeks. At least one Confederate soldier, private in six North Carolina, drowned, and his body washed miles down the river until it could be retrieved. Camps got so muddy and so bad at this point that a lot of Confederate units started looking for somewhere else to camp just to get out of this deep, deep mud. Robert Hatton wrote that a Tennessee hog pen would scarcely be more uncomfortable as a location. We will move this evening if it will just stop raining long enough. For the last three weeks, we have had only three days without rain. It's raining now. Has been since daylight. When will it cease? There is no calculating. Our men, officers and all, are blue at the balk in our enterprise, occasioned by this rain. It didn't stop raining again until August 24th, and by then the roads were nearly impassable. Supply wagons trying to get food and forage and other supplies, ammunition, up to the Confederates at Valley Mountain sank up to their ankles and could not be pulled out. Fords of streams became so impassable that no one could get across them. John Worsham described Teamsters who asserted that, quote, it was hard for them to haul from Mirrorboro, 60 miles away, any more than it took to feed their teams back and forth. I saw dead mules lying in the road with nothing but their ears showing above the mud. When I first started reading accounts like that, I just assumed that was hyperbole, but I have read so many of these accounts. It is clear that horses and mules thrashing about trying to get out of deep, deep mud would bury themselves in roads in every campaign where it rained a lot, up the peninsula, certainly a cheap mountain. By the end of August, R. E. Lee had had about enough. He rode home. It rains here all the time, literally. There has not been sunshine enough since my arrival to dry my clothes. It is raining now, has been all day, last night, day before, and day before that, etc., etc. But we must be patient. It is quite cool, too. I have on all my winter clothes and am riding in my overcoat. All the clouds seem to concentrate over this ridge of mountains, and by whatever wind they are driven, give us rain. On September 1st, he wrote his wife, it must be quite cold there now, judging from the temperatures here, and has been raining in these mountains since July 24th. 
constant cold rains with no shelter but tents have aggregate, aggravated measles. All the drawbacks with impassable roads have paralyzed our efforts. The worst of the rain is that the ground has become so saturated with water that the constant travel on the roads has made them almost impassable so that I cannot get up sufficient supplies for the troops to move. As late as September 9th, the roads were still bad. Lee again wrote, the weather is still unfavorable to us. The roads, or rather tracks of mud, are almost impassable, and the number of sick large. But nonetheless, he had concluded he could no longer wait. Winter was clearly coming on. Conditions weren't going to improve, he didn't think. The day before, he wrote that last letter on September 8th, Lee decided that it was now or never. He had to march his army up to Cheat Mountain, try to drive those Federals away, because if he wasn't able to do it now, he wouldn't be able to do it through the winter. So he takes a chance. We often talk about Lee as a, a gambling officer. We talk about the great uh, chances he took at places like Fredericksburg or in the Seven Days. But here we see that same quality again. The odds stacked against him. Lee decided that all he could do was attack. But the topography was as tough as the weather and the roads. And so he came up with what is, in retrospect, a very complicated plan that involves six separate brigades moving separately, ultimately forming three different attacking columns moving against the Federals up on Cheat Mountain and in the valley around Cheat Mountain. And because they had different distances to cross and because the roads were so bad, the first Confederate column marched on September 9th, but others marched on the 10th or even the 11th. And once all of the brigades were in position, surprise attack would begin at dawn on September 12th, but because those brigades were so far from each other, the only signal would be gunfire. Once the first column attacked, the others were to listen and to move up the mountain as well. At first, there was hope. The weather seemed to cooperate. Uh, one Tennessee soldier wrote on the 9th, something getting out of order with the clouds. It did not rain on us last night, to the astonishment of all. September 10th was bright and beautiful, according to one soldier, except, again I quote, the valley was wrapped in a dense fog, which extended to a certain uniform height, presenting to the view of the beholder the appearance of a vast lake or sea out of which the different hilltops emerged at irregular intervals like islands. September 11th, with the Confederates out in the field moving toward Cheat Mountain, it started raining again. Roads, really mountain paths in some cases, became slick. Uh, men, horses, mules, wagons began slipping, going down steep hillsides. Occasionally guns going off. Colonel Albert Rust was a politician from Arkansas and because of where his men were stationed at the beginning of the campaign, he was to lead the attack. He was to be the first to attack those Federals up on top of Cheat Mountain. But trying to get his men into position was horrendous. At one point, all they could do was get into a single line, 1,500 men in a single line, one after the other, and pull their way up mountains, grasping the belt or the coat of the man in front of them. And still some fell, and groups of them would slip down mountainsides. A soldier in the first Tennessee at this time wrote, the windows of the heavens were wide open, and rain and torrents fell as it never fell before since the flood. It got so bad that night when they camped that a bear wandered into the camp of the first Tennessee, apparently looking for a place to get out of the rain. September 12th was the day that the attack was to begin. It was dry, it was cold, and it was very foggy. 16th Tennessee got up, realized that some of them had left their guns out in the rain during the night. They were afraid their guns wouldn't work, so they did what they normally would have done in peacetime without thinking of it. They fired off a few rounds, 
which of course alerted the Federals that somebody was out there with weapons. Albert Rust moved into the valley directly in front of Fort Milroy, and there was so much fog they couldn't see anything, and they ran into Union pickets. Two sides start shooting at each other, Union pickets run back up to Fort Milroy and alert everybody that the Confederates are coming. And the attack just completely fell apart. Inside the fort, there were about 300 men, soldiers, musicians, cooks, civilian sutlers. Every one of them grabbed a gun, prepared to defend the position. Albert Rust came up with about 1,500 men, five to one advantage, but he didn't know that. It didn't look that way. When he got up there, his men were cold, covered with mud, exhausted. He saw what seemed to be a very dangerous Union position. He took one look at it, and he said, I don't think so. And he turned his men around and marched them back down the mountain without bothering to send even a message to Lee of what he was doing. Down in the valley, Lee waited with one of the attack columns. They waited until about 10 o'clock. By then, it was obvious that something had gone wrong. No attack was happening. Lee wasn't quite sure what to do. He didn't have any information coming from the front. He decided all he could do was retreat and fall back. For the next four days, Lee and the Army of the Northwest waited around Cheap Mountain, hoping to find some opening, hoping, hoping to find some opportunity to do some damage to the Federals, but in the end, Lee decided that was not going to happen. So the Army retreated back to Valley Mountain in the rain, in the mud. A soldier from Georgia Regiment wrote at this time, Night comes in cold and drizzly and starless. No fire is allowed by the officer of the guard, standing alone on an outpost in Egyptian darkness and numbed with cold, while the muffled patter of raindrops on the fallen leaves continually suggests the stealthy footfalls of an approaching foe. I reach the conclusion that it subjects a man to some inconvenience to die for his country. Lee kept the army at Valley Mountain for a week and decided that there was nothing more to be gained on the Cheap Mountain front. He left a small force just to observe, took the rest of his army and marched it south, down to Sewell Mountain, down to where Floyd and Wise were. Um, on September 10th, just as Lee was getting ready to move his men into position to attack a Cheap Mountain, the uh, Federal Army under Cox had attacked John B. Floyd at Carnifex Ferry, and miracle of miracles, John Floyd had actually held the position and driven off these Federals, but he wasn't going to hold them off much longer. He immediately sent word begging Wise to cross the river and help him, and of course Wise refused. Lee hoped that he could get down there and convince Floyd and Wise to combine to do something, and at least something could be gained on this part of the Confederate line. He didn't have much luck. And then, the crowning moment of the bad weather season in West Virginia. On September 27th, nothing less than a Category 1 hurricane brushed the Florida coast, came up the Atlantic coast, crossed overland in North Carolina around Jacksonville or Wilmington, and drove straight into Virginia and West Virginia because it came so close to the autumn equinox, uh, they referred to it as the equinoctical storm. So now, Confederate and Federal soldiers are dealing with hurricane conditions. Lee wrote home, it's raining heavily, the men are all exposed on the mountain with the enemy opposite us. We are without tents and for two nights I have lain buttoned up in my overcoat. Back on Cheat Mountain, Union Colonel John Beatty reported text tents, waist high in water, and where others stood this morning, the water is 10 feet deep. Two men in the 6th Ohio reported drowned. The river seems to stretch from the base of one mountain to the other, and the whole valley is one scene of excitement. Rutherford B. Hayes, future president on Rosecrans' staff, wrote simply, the mud and floods have pretty much ended this campaign. And it was true, on October 6th, Rosecrans decided nothing more could be accomplished in the mountains. He pulled his men back into a more compact line and ordered them to build winter quarters. Nothing could happen until spring. At the end of October, 
Richmond called Lee back, intending to send him to South Carolina and Georgia to check on fortifications and help see to the defense of Savannah. He left knowing that he was being criticized heavily in the Richmond media. He left with a new beard that he had grown to keep his face warm during the terrible chilly conditions up on Cheat Mountain. Both his beard and now his hair turned gray. Some people said it was because of the campaign itself. He left with a crush. He had fallen in love at first sight with a horse, a big gray horse named Greenbrier, ridden by one of his officers. In February of 62, he would see that officer and his horse again, and this time he would buy the horse, rename him Traveler. I don't think he wanted to be reminded of the Greenbrier Valley. And of course, Traveler's buried outside. It may have been the one positive thing that Lee brought out of West Virginia. What happened? Much had gone wrong for the Confederates at Cheat Mountain to damage Lee's reputation, leadership failures at all levels. Think of Albert Rust. Hunger, rampant illness, old and inadequate equipment, including flintlock muskets, and unforgiving terrain all played major roles. Confederate morale was low. Some critics have pointed the finger at Lee's complicated attack plan. And there's no doubt that the Federals and their officers fought well. So if we want to understand what happened at Cheat Mountain, there are lots of obvious reasons we could talk about. But for the Confederates, there was only one excuse to be made. John Worsham wrote, failure was owing more to mud than anything else. In all my experience of the war, I never saw so much mud. And as far as Lee himself was concerned, knowing that he was being criticized, knowing that his assignment had fallen through his fingertips, Lee said very little about federal soldiers or any problems with his own plans or any of those other things. To Lee, the answer was clear and simple. He wrote Governor John Letcher, a terrible storm which lasted all night and in which they had to stand drenched to the skin in a cold rain caused this. But for the rainstorm, I have no doubt it would have succeeded. And he wrote his wife, the ruler of the universe sent a storm to disconcert a well-laid plan and to destroy my hopes. And for a while, it seemed that that storm had destroyed his reputation and his career as well. If the Civil War had somehow ended at the end of 1861, or even if McClellan had taken Richmond, I think, in 1862, R.E. Lee would be remembered largely for the Cheap Mountain Campaign. And we would not be here right now. This building would not exist. The recumbent Lee would not be behind me. This might still be Washington College if it was still open. But we all know that's not what happened. And in part, that didn't happen because in the winter of 1861-62 and on into the spring, the ruler of the universe, if you will, or perhaps just the patterns of a very unusual weather year, decided to find another general to taunt and torment, first on the Potomac and then on the peninsula. His name was George McClellan. And in McClellan's failure, and with the chance explosion of shrapnel, R.E. Lee got a second chance after all. Thank you very much. So I found that a very refreshing and fascinating well, application you. of what I think of as a null school historiographical approaches to think about something like the weather. And I just wondered whether you had any thoughts about what it is that left this lacuna for you, because a null school approaches are not new. Um, what is it about Civil War historiography that um, caused this to be a topic left alone until you came along to discover it? <sighs> I think a lot of topics have been left to my generation and future generations. Um, 
I don't know. I think we've had a tendency to study the war in terms of campaigns and battles. And so what we do is we compartmentalize, or to use the academic phrase we all love these days, we get in our silos. And so we know about weather in this campaign or this campaign, but the notion that it might have had that sort of effect never seemed to occur to us as Civil War historians. And I, I don't know why, because other military historians do this all the time. World War I historians do this all the time. Um, for me, it was really just sort of by chance, I wrote a book about Perryville, and I discovered this drought. And it was clear that the drought had shaped that campaign. And then I started thinking about how I taught my classes uh, in terms of all that rain down on the peninsula that slowed down McClellan. And I started telling my classes, you know, somebody needs to write a really good book about Civil War weather, but nobody did. So I finally just wrote it myself. I actually think we're in an interesting period in Civil War history and that the sesquicentennial, if it did nothing else, has led to all sorts of new approaches and uh, new interpretations of the war. In terms of what we do as historians, I think it's a pretty exciting time. Uh, and the final thing I would say is that for a long time, environmental history has existed, but it's existed entirely separately from Civil War history historians in one group really not having much to do with the other group. And we finally started talking to each other. It was a big conference over at the University of Georgia a few years ago. Uh, once we started having these conversations among ourselves, we started seeing all sorts of interesting environmental history, which we're just, we're just starting to scratch the surface now. I don't know if that's a good answer, because ultimately I don't know the answer, but it sounded good, I guess. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, I guess we go with the microphone. Yes, sir. On the union, excuse me. On the union side, uh, officers report soldiers' letters. What do they say about the events after the fact or during? Well, during, during they're dealing with the same conditions, if not worse. They're horrified, uh, but they are from Indiana, Ohio. In most cases, they're at least a little used to this kind of weather. Um, they're struck by the mountains the steepness. Uh, they write a lot about the rain. Um, you know, there's, a, there's a, an incident where a, a regiment decided to put all of its wounded and sick on an island and then this flash flood came up and they barely managed to get their guys back over. They had to build a, a bridge with wagons. Uh, they're equally appalled. They have the luxury throughout this campaign of essentially being on the defensive. They can hold a position rather than have to move through that mud, which I think makes it a little easier for the men up at Cheat Mountain. Uh, it bogs down Jacob Cox in that other column. Um, they, they, you know, they will all say, uh, you know, it was the mud and the rain that stopped us. And really, when you go into 1862, Cox will try again. He, he tries to go to my part of the world. He tries to penetrate um, along the border, the modern border of West Virginia, Virginia, because they want to cut the Virginia and Tennessee Railroad, which is the main Confederate connector. They get as far as Narrows, Virginia, but mud stops them again. They're just amazed by it. They all know something unusual is happening with the weather. Civilians know that something is unusual happening with the weather. We, we can find all of these accounts in the official records. We just haven't paid much attention to them. Uh, but they knew. And so they're writing about the same things, or as I said, even worse conditions. They're the ones who are getting snowed on. It's a question up here in the front. Yeah, it's like you have to think about it. You can't judge today what we did back then. You can't judge today what, what happened back then. You have to look at the little things, um, like, you, like the weather, like with D-Day. Then you've mm -hmm. got to go with like the trains, the horses, mm -hmm. the mules all this and then how everything was made yes and then it always has fascinated me that after the war we didn't have property lines because they would use the post and rail fences they were told you take the first rail you take the next rail but by the time you went through a whole army there was no i mean our whole group camped there to use it for firewood for litters for um making barricades there was nothing left. It was dry wood, ready to burn. They were tired, perfect. But then the fence is gone. See, that's something I've always thought of that, how you know, they did that, the little things. And like teaching school, 
you've got to get the men arrested in something new of it. Sure, absolutely. Mm -hmm. They're not just burning yeah. fence rails, they're sleeping on fence There's rails. There's hundreds of new the things mud. to learn. Uh, and, and I appreciate the fact that you mentioned the horses and mules again. I have sort of a side project I'm working on, mostly just pulling material out of the manuscript I've already written, but several of us are writing articles for an issue of environmental history, which is the big journal in that field, and it's going to be about animals. Uh, I think I knew this intellectually, but I'm just appalled at how many horses and mules died in this war and how they died. I mean, the current estimate is something like a million. Um, it's massive, and the way they died, and sometimes through battlefield wounds, and sometimes you know because they weren't being fed, but often it's in this rainy weather. And so anytime you read any book about any campaign in the Civil War and there's rain, uh, think about Johnston's retreat from Manassas in 62, you just have to imagine the roads just littered with dead horses and mules, or sometimes buried horses and mules. It's just, as somebody who grew up with a farm, it's just appalling to me. But nonetheless, that's a reality of the war. And those are horses and mules that aren't going to be around at the end of the war to plow. Would you think of, just like a, a Gettysburg, the stench? Of course. The stench. The stench. I mean, the more and more I was reading about this, and um, we uh, give an award at Vicksburg for the equine student, and then I had an article that I'd gotten for the student, and the professor said, oh my gosh, and he made copies of it for when I gave out the award. I got into it, and the, the horses down there at the Museum of Fine Arts hanging out, you had to keep them fed too. Either you ate or the horse ate, but you needed the horse. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it's just, it's amazing. Um, the little, little things that, um, come into it that we're not even thinking of that we're sure and not to belabor, not to belabor the point too much but during the siege of Chattanooga the federal army inside Chattanooga they not only started to run out of food they started to run out of forage and so they had to make decisions which horses do we feed and which horses do we let starve to death and so they let the artillery horses eat and they let the others die we'll take one more question I'm sorry we're running out of time What, were Lee, what was Lee's own assessment of his failure, and how did he deal with that over time? Lee's assessment was the weather. That was it. He, he never questioned his own plan. He never criticized his soldiers. He thought he would have succeeded had it not been for the bad weather, and he always made that argument. Now, what else he was thinking, we don't know for sure. If you look at the rest of Lee's career, You'll never see him again come up with a complicated battle plan like the one he tried at Cheap Mountain. Uh, if you look at Lee after the seven days, and I think it took the seven days too, throw Cheap Mountain into that and he becomes very intolerant of officers who don't obey their orders. He starts purging the army of people like Rust uh, on the peninsula at somebody like John Magruder. Uh, he wants men that he can give discretionary orders to and, and expect them to do what's necessary. So I think it changes his command style in a lot of ways. But as far as what he said, he never said anything publicly. Everything he says about the failure of Cheat Mountain, he says privately in letters to the government, to his family. Thank you all so much for coming. Appreciate it. Have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you all very much.